does your community have sort of special code words or jargon that you think might be really good if it was more broadly used? Hmm. <laughs> I, my brain immediately jumped to something that we just use for for her people in the building. We say Pink Panther just mean like, hey, do this like when your parents say we're going to the the, the restaurant to so be on your like kind of like what outside people should see. Uh, <laughs> uh, <where is> it? <laughs> the term is Pink Panther. Yeah, so that's just our our school term for. So for our school, we actually are renters. We have mm. the entire bottom floor of a of a church that is, okay. you know, we have during our school day. Well, we actually have three big rooms of that that are our exclusive use. Like mm. we are the only ones with the keys. No one from the church is allowed to go in there. Mm -hmm. But then we have shared spaces too, mm -hmm. and you know, so there's like a big industrial kitchen there, and they on Saturdays do they do meals. They have volunteers who do meals for the less fortunate in the area, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. people that need a meal. So there's volunteers that'll be coming in there prepping. So Pink Panther is our way of like, hey, the volunteers who don't quite understand what our school is about right. <laughs> and might not be okay with y'all just like kind of playing that game that just seems like to them, it's they're just running around yelling. But for right, us, right. It's, <laughs> no, you're actively getting that energy out and you're working together to come up with rules and structuring uh -huh. yourself and all those educational benefits that we see Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. someone else doesn't it's like hey pink panther so maybe you know that then everyone in the school goes oh, okay like we're gonna take it down a notch uh -huh. Uh -huh. just in terms of like you know it would be the same as you know when you have someone coming over to visit you clean the house before they visit right. a little bit right. more than when they don't and that's pink panther is basically that idea of do like, you know the origin of it like what is it how, how does, how does i think it was just the I, it was there before I started, and I uh -huh, think it was just uh -huh. a cool way for them to be able to like to say something. I, I've uh -huh, had jobs uh -huh. in the past where there were just like kind of code words of like yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and it was more for just like, hey, are you okay? But you don't want mm -hmm. that person to know that they might be like, you don't want to go like, hey, is that person bo bothering you? Yeah, right yeah, in front yeah. Of them. So you say yeah. like this little little saying in front of a question that tells them. This is your opportunity to tell me, like, hey, let's go have a conversation over there. You know, right, right, right. No, yeah. that, that's a perfect example, though. Is is having that code word, you know, it, it, it's something that 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 you have to be context sensitive, um, mm -hmm. and and that's one of the things the kids are learning is like, okay, there's there's a context I need to attend to what's outside of you know, a, a bordering on my world. Um, because we're, what you're doing is is recognizing that there is a larger community that can have an impact if they see things they don't understand and right. and can't deal with productively because they don't have you know they're not part of the justice system or the uh, uh, restoration committee or you know like yeah like that's not an opportunity we have with them so we need to operate in a different way that's a perfect right. example and that, I I think that's yeah that that's probably the the term that because it comes up a lot just for it, it comes up for understanding that we have our rules, but also we are in a building that we don't control all of the rules. Right. So right. here is our way of going, oh, now we're on like, you know, this has nothing to do with the person sitting next to me in school or the right. staff member <clears throat> or whatever. Like the landlord says, don't do this. So mm -hmm. we don't do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs, so that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host. Don Berg. Hello and welcome. This is Don Berg, Agentic Schools Podcast, and I am with Rick Olson of the Tallgrass Sudbury School in LaGrange, Illinois. Yeah, welcome, Rick. All right. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm I'm excited to be here. 
Cool, cool. So the way I like to start is with storytelling. So okay, tell me a story about someone who really took advantage of what tall grass Sudbury has to offer, really got value out of what of coming there and taking advantage of the, what you have. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to tell my favorite story. I haven't I haven't talked to any individuals about the podcast, so I'm not going to use any names. Cool. Just because I believe very strongly in like if they didn't say use my name, I'm not going to use it. Absolutely. So this is actually from quite a few years ago. It was before my time there, but I've heard this story and it just encapsulates what we do so well mm. that it's still the story I like to tell. So we had a student that had gone through our gone through our school pretty much from the time that they were they started kind of we don't really use grades but to say sixth grade age mm -hmm. and went all the way through their their graduation all the way through until they were ready to go out into the world and they they went through and their first their first experience in the professional world was they went and to a local cafe, a local coffee shop, mm. wanted to just kind of work there, get their feet wet and kind of find out what was next for them from mm -hmm. there. And it took this individual about six months to realize I don't want to be out on the floor. Mm. I want to be here, but I want to be back there making the decisions and running the business. And mm. like, I want to do this, but I want to do this as the person in charge. Mm -hmm. I want to run my own business. So they went as soon as that impulse hit them, as soon as they had that, this is what I want. Then all of a sudden they had that motivation to go, I'm going to go get into school. Mm -hmm. I, they didn't go directly into college. They just went and worked and were trying to figure it out. They went into college. And my favorite thing about this is they had to then go to business school, which includes just a ton of math right they had not done a single specific math class at our mm. school they that was just not an interest of theirs at all so they had to go in and there was you know no problem with getting into school they mm. got into school had to do they did have to do some placement testing to get into the program take a couple of classes to kind of catch up on those some of those skills but because they had the investment now, because they had the right. interest now, they flew through those classes and all of a sudden they're getting a master's in business, not just getting the business degree, but they went right. into graduate school and they immediately were able to get into running their own business and they have their own shop and it is successful. And it was all based on you know what we believe in, which is right. when the interest is there, that is when you will do your best learning mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and their path was was taking that time to figure out what do i want instead of you know the opposite that we see so often in other settings where you know it's kind of given to you <laughs> like right. here are your things and well i guess i did good at science so i'm going to go into science mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. this was i made my path and had all of the confidence, which is really what right, I love right. about what we do, to go, oh, this is what I want to do. It's going to take me a little bit more work to get started, but now I, w I know what I want, and I'm fine. I can go do that, and I'm just going to take the ball and run with it. Right, right. Yeah, and that's, that's I think, one of the things that, that comes up a lot is life is a crooked path. It is yeah. never, even, even the people who think they've got it. I mean, okay. There are a few people who are like when my, my partner, in fact, mm -hmm. she decided early in her life that she wanted to do math and she did math for 40 years, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. she had, uh, you know, so occasionally, you know, it's clear and, and she did, but she hated traditional school. So, so her, she read uh, Summerhill when she was 14 and that sort of inspired her to you know, when she got into teaching, it was like, this is not going to be just simply a lecture and a, and a, you know, spew it out kind of thing. So she spent her life doing, she was doing flipped classrooms before that was a term, you know, she was doing things, you know, to really engage and, and, and get people to, I mean, she taught so 
non-traditionally that I could go into one of her advanced graduate level courses and fully participate on the first day with absolutely no skills in math <laughs> because yeah. she was doing something. She was starting at a level. It's just like asking a question of, uh, I think the question was, what is symmetry? And then, you know, we, it, we break it into small groups, have discussions, you know, it didn't require any math skills to talk about mm -hmm. that. Now, right. day two, I was lost, but <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I wasn't there day two, but, but she knew I'd be lost. So, because immediately what happens is these other people in my group all have some serious math skills. So, so they start to then formulate it in mathematical terms or they, they, after we have a certain basic level discussion, they start thinking, well, what about this? You know, and it happens to be a mathematical idea. Now at the level of discussion, it was, I was, it wasn't a big deal that I didn't know that, but, but yes, yeah, so, <laughs> But for most people, the straight line, even most people who go to traditional schools, the straight line is yeah. not a thing. For right. most people right. in the world, life is a crooked path. And and it just, you know, if you don't have the confidence to pursue what you want, you're pursuing defaults or, or things that are given or just things you've been exposed to rather than something like if you don't have, there is a certain skill to knowing what you want. Right. And, right. and, and. You know, when you look at, for me, the, the big thing is we can learn all of the, like, we can go into that traditional setting and we can learn all of these things, but what are we right. learning it for? Are we learning it just to get past that next roadblock they put in front of us? Right, or, right. you know, I have to do this to get in, to stay with my friends in the next grade because we have to separate everyone by age in that in that path for some reason right. you know and and when you're learning for that you're not retaining it so now it's what am i doing this for because i don't mm -hmm. remember what i just was working on a month ago yeah and yeah. and i'm just feeling like i'm going through the motions and what am i preparing myself for at that point mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. which is 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 something that like really goes into the the kind of root of of why i like alternative learning styles is mm -hmm. i i've never been someone who i can't i just don't i do not function in a this is what you do and the reason to do that is because i said this is what to do mm -hmm. like that just doesn't mm -hmm. work for me if you can give me a why then even if i don't agree with the why i usually can do it but unless i understand the why then i'm just gonna like have this even if it's not a full-on fight back against it right. there's going to be a little friction there of you're just i'm just being talked at instead of to right um and that's really you know uh before i before i got into the world of sudbury just working as a I, as a teaching artist as, mm. is what I kind of did. Like my number one focus was I want to be what I didn't have and what I didn't have mm. was someone who ever talked to me like a human. They always talked to me like right. someone beneath them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I rejected that. So let me be, let me work with you. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I love about alternative learning but specifically about the the Sudbury model mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and that's interesting because that, that that experience is exactly what the scientific models have found in motivation is that there's up to the point so, so there's kind of controlled motivations and autonomous motivations and mm -hmm. there's breakdowns in between those but but really those controlled motivations go up to that point of sort of and uh when the social emotions like guilt and and pride and things like that are involved is that that generally when you're motivated in that way it tends to be negative now there is a teeny slice on the controlled side that actually has neutral to slightly positive and that's the you know like the positive side of interject so but on the other side the autonomous ones it's like that's where you you it's all positive consequences it, it's still extrinsic that's the interesting thing is that uh, autonomous motivations are made up of two forms of extrinsic motivation and and then intrinsic motivation and mm -hmm. those two forms are like the identified and the integrated. So what you're talking about is, is if you know why, that's that, that, that identified piece, is you can identify the positive possibilities here. You can understand why. You can justify it. 
Right. And that's the beginning of that really positive forms of motivation. It's like, okay, if I get it, then I go. And the other thing is, is that if your needs, if your psychological needs are supported in that environment, you may upgrade your motivation to that integrate. Like, oh yeah, okay, this is this is who I need to be in this situation. And then that could yeah. develop into intrinsic motivation, but some things never get to that level of intrinsic motivation. Some things right. are just like, I do this because a person like me just does that. You know, <laughs> whatever my identity is, that's the integrated piece. Is like, yeah. hey, that's just, I, you know, it's not joyful, but it's like, hey, got to do it. And I'm cool with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and there's the, the reality of, of our life is there are all of those situations where, okay, here's how it should work, but I don't get to control what is, you know, <laughs> the, the electric company doesn't care what the, <laughs> you know they, they i have to figure that out you know yeah, yeah. um so being able to navigate that and and understanding the difference mm -hmm. because i don't mm -hmm. know that you always get that understanding of right okay right. here's what i want here's what is required of me to to survive mm -hmm. and I have to be able to balance both of those. Right, right. Or at least navigate both of those, right, right, even right. if it doesn't feel balanced all the time. And, and that's one of the things that some people get confused about when they hear free schools, which Trish Sudbury is not identified. I mean, it, it started in an era when, when free school was the term, right. but meaning freedom. But in that, when they find out about, you know, a lot of people say, you know, no rules, but that's not really true, oh. is... The, the the difference is not it, it, i guess what my, my question is how do you help kids in this in the tall grass environment which is how they have a tremendous amount of freedom but it's not unlimited and how do you how does the school help them recognize here are the things you need to do even if you don't like it yeah <laughs> you you made a, a perfect like four words that often get brought up and then we really defunct for and this is usually for the interested parent who doesn't fully understand yet and is mm -hmm. still learning but that idea of like well there are no rules and then it's like well here's our 35 page law book that <laughs> yeah. every student has to not necessarily know but they have to follow <laughs> and so yeah how we do that you know there are you know not to just be a a, a Marvel meme, but you know, with with I, I guess it's not with great power for us. It's right. with great freedom comes mm -hmm. great responsibility. Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. to you have to maintain that, not necessarily maintain your freedom, but maintain the trust that we're giving you to have mm -hmm. that freedom. Mm -hmm. And we do that through for our school, it's a restoration committee, mm -hmm. which is a daily occurrence this you know for us we do it right in the middle of our day we have a kind of I, I sometimes get off track a little bit so <laughs> bear with me uh we have a we have a staggered schedule so oh. you know we have a set amount of hours that the student has to be there mm. but that can be any they can get there anytime between 9 and ten thirty. Okay. So long as they stay for the right amount of hours and mm. almost all of our students, whether they get there at nine or 10 30, stay till the last second of the day mm -hmm. um, because they want to be there. Right. It's okay. just giving them the ability to get there at the schedule that works best for them and their family. Mm -hmm. But so about midday, once everyone is there on a daily basis, we have restoration committee. This is all and everything at our school is run by these we we don't even use the term students that often <laughs> right, right. we use the term school members mm -hmm. because as a staff member like myself i am the exact same as the seven-year-old and i'm the exact right. same as the 17 year old mm -hmm. in terms of my power at the school obviously right, right. we're all different but within that group we are expected to if our friends, if our, whether that be our best friend or just someone that we don't interact with at school that much, if we see them breaking the laws that we've all agreed to mm -hmm. and the rules that we've all agreed to, 
we're expected to write that up. And that is not the idea of punishment. That is the idea mm -hmm. of these are the rules that we have established and these were not followed. Mm -hmm. And those go from everything as simple as, you know, you're expected at our school to have the ability to take care of yourself. So mm -hmm. you left out the mess. It's your job to clean up the mess. I saw mm -hmm. the mess. I write up the mess. Mm -hmm. And to things that, you know, get get more serious that, you know, anyone interacting with people every day, you might have some more serious things. Right. All of this is expected to be written up. And then the next day at Restoration Committee, we go through what got written up the day before. That Restoration Committee is in a, two elected positions. There is a RC clerk who is basically the presiding body over the committee. This is, for our school, we have two different school members that get elected into that so that they don't have to do it every day of the week, right. that they can mm -hmm. switch off that responsibility to make it not something that is a burden. But yeah. something that they want to do. And then uh, I have the same, an RC secretary who is taking the notes and making sure that everything is written down and we have a trail of everything that has happened. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, there is a four person jury mm -hmm. that will include one staff member and then one school member of the three different kind of age brackets that we mm -hmm. use of youngest kind of the middle age and then the older students mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. anything that comes into that restoration committee, you have a truly a jury of your peers listening mm -hmm. to what happened. So the expectation is you're going to be there. You're going to be called in. You're, if you're a school member of, you know, any school member is going to be on a rotating jury list that usually does like two weeks at a time. So you're going to be asked to go in there and listen to these cases. And and then it is done with kind of formal order of, mm. you know, we call in the people, the person that wrote it up and the person that may have, you know, oh, so-and-so was roughhousing the other day, you know, and I wrote this up. Okay, we bring them in, ask, you know, did the, you know, what, what do you remember of this? Do you remember this happening? Can you tell us mm. more about what happened? Kind of state your case. Right. They will leave the room. We will then, as the jury and the clerk, go over the case again. Did this break a rule? Did mm. this not? Yes, it did. Okay, what should the result of that be? Mm -hmm. You know, most... I would say 90% of what we deal with is minor enough that it's, okay, this is just a, a reminder, a warning, mm -hmm. a, you know, something very minor. And then, oh, okay, this has happened a few times for this individual. Okay, well, then maybe the result is we're going to give you an extra chore at chore time because you've been leaving messes out or, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and that's going to be agreed upon by that entire group. So mm -hmm. it's not not going to be just one adult saying you did that here's your punishment you know? right right <laughs> and that turns into 90 i would say 95 to maybe 98 percent of all the cases we get is usually like three a day mm -hmm. and almost all of them is a is a school member coming in and being asked about it going like oh you know what i did that yeah mm -hmm. I, that right. that happened and i accept that I am responsible for that, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the long winded way to get to the answer that you're looking for is right. right. How do you learn responsibility? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, well, this is, this is one of the key things we do is right. every day right. we're going to have, you know, <laughs> it's, it's I, in, in some ways harder to stand up in front of all your peers and go like, Oh yeah, I messed up. Right. Right. But right. we have something where, almost 100% of the time, you know, that's a 98, it's a pretty high percentage of people right, right. like, oh, yeah, I did that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's, that's a really important aspect to feature is that part of the reason it works is because it's not punitive, and it's not humiliating, and it's not, right. you know, all those negative things that most people associate with school discipline. Right. Are, I mean, it's a trope of our culture. You know, you can see it in comic strips and movies and in tele television, the whole thing is it's tropes of, of 
humiliation and, and, and punishment and, and just really negative experiences, even if nothing other than like if you think of a breakfast club from the 80s, mm. um, you know, utter boredom, you know, just being made to do nothing. Yeah. Which is just as negative in, in certain because boredom is a negative state of mind. <laughs> it's not neutral. <laughs> right. It, it is actually something people suffer with. And so and, and then, of course, the movie is fun because they make something out of it. You know, <laughs> like, like they, right. they end up they end up exerting their autonomy, doing things to counter that that stupidity. And, and it makes a fun movie. But, yeah. but that's a really important thing to notice, yeah, I think, is that and, and, and it's it's also interesting because it's a trope in our society. It's really hard to find positive examples of something other than that. Right. Like it's really, you know, there is no movie or, or, you know, meme quality thing I can point to that would be the positive side of, of like the, the type of thing you're doing. Because, because quite frankly, that's boring. Right. <laughs> you know, like from a dramatic <laughs> point of view, it's like, oh, I go to a boring school, you know, in when, when you think that all these tropes don't apply, because that's right. what makes things, you know, conflictual and, and dramatic. It's like, well, on the other hand, you know, people don't believe it when they hear about how, you know, oh, I don't have recess because I don't have to go to class. And, you know, it's like yeah. they hear the, the opposite side and then it, it's unbelievable. <laughs> right. It, there, There's no need for we have a structured 20 minutes for you to, like, let out all your energy because right. we're right. saying, do you want to let out your energy right now? Go let out your energy right now. Right, right. Um, right. And, and there are the very, very few time constraints we're ever going to put on you. Is at this time, you have to do a restoration degree, you know, or these couple of different things. Or, once again, that idea of how we learn to be, or, you know, make choices within what we want, but what we also have committed to do. Right. You know, if, if students have asked for a club or a class, and that has been developed by, you know, in our case, it's usually the staff members, because we all have some sort of background in mm. teaching in some way. So whether that be formalized teaching or my, my way of, of learning through play and taking lessons and putting them into more storytelling and games and things right. like that, you know, we might have a class. Well, now you have committed that you wanted to be in that class. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be respectful to the other members of that class, now you've put a time commitment onto, mm -hmm. I'm going to come to this thing. Right. But other right. than that, we don't have to say, okay, here's your 15 minutes to let loose. Right, you know, right, right. Because you can take those minutes whenever you want to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, Peter Gray put out a thing, I think it was this morning, but, but he connected to a, a news program in New Zealand was covering you know this a dramatic story about how there's this principal who in their 20 minute recess periods they don't have any rules you know they they eventually did clarify <laughs> that the kids make the rules <laughs> right it's not so and that's that's typically it's so funny because because there is that sort of tendency to go to well if kids are in charge there's no rules <laughs> and yeah. and it's not not the case it, you know kids are actually okay with rules it's when they make them they it's they're okay with them right well i mean humans humans always do better with ownership of what they're doing right you know right. when that has, that goes against ages being a part of it like mm -hmm. humans mm -hmm. if they have ownership and and in in anything they are going to be more involved in wanting to keep that keep that that ownership, which mm -hmm. means following the rules that you've set for yourself. Right, right. And and it, it also kind of counters the the typical sort of the other cultural trope is uh, what's that one? Kids trapped on the island. Oh, Lord of the uh, Lord of Lord the Lord of the Flies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is 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 it, when they had to when they made so I eventually you know read the book and was like ah you know the, <laughs> the, I I disliked the book intensely because one of the things he did as an author was he gave no context for who these kids were setting out. He just sort of like 
you just enter the scene of them on this island. Right. And he gave so little description of what the thing was. Now, what, what I thought was very telling was that in, in each of the movie versions, the filmmakers were like, they can't do that. <laughs> and they just, or <laughs> if, they, if they could, they decided not to. And right. in each case, they made sure to set the context of an elite boarding school. Hmm. And it's like, yeah, that's the place where you can get that kind of unhealthy, dysfunctional behavior because they have an institutional structure that does nothing to mitigate those problematic behaviors. In fact, right. the way that those institutions are portrayed in movies, you can go back to some earlier, oh, what's Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Okay. Like that is one of those ones where they make it clear that the institution clearly not only doesn't mitigate against it, it actually implicitly encourages the, the you know, horrible abuses, hazing mm -hmm. and things like that. And it's like, that's where it, when the, the filmmakers in Lord of the Flies decided to set a context, they set the right context because they, they took to institutions that are known to be basically abusive or to allow abuse. And so, and so it's really different to then have something in a school where the kids have ownership of it. And because they're, they're going to hear, you know, a jury of their peers, they're going to, they, they, they realize that this is normal everyday activity results in conflict, results in challenges with each other. But it doesn't mean that you then, you know, like, like, when they're when they're coming up with consequences, my guess is, since I don't know your school, mm -hmm. uh, that because I know others, it's like, well, they're not going to be coming up with absurd punishments because that doesn't fit with their own sense of like how how would I respond to that, you know? Right. Um, how would I feel in that circumstance? Because they are on doing it on a daily as a daily practice means that they inevitably interact with that on you know. If they never get a thing written up against them, they're gonna get something. You know, they're gonna write things. They're gonna, you know, they're yeah. gonna have to play on the jury. They're gonna, they have to engage with this institution. To, yeah, to and, and I think, way. I think one of the the things that I've seen this year come up is even a school member that you think when they are in there isn't mm. like maybe engaged you see like how much they're actually learning the process of how to work together because we've had, you know, we have students who, Oh, this is my two weeks. And today I don't feel like being here. So I'm not really like as a, as a staff jury member, as an adult, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, and as someone who went through a very traditional schooling process, I, I'm telling families and students, I am the term we use is de-schooling. Mm -hmm. uh, I am doing that constantly because there are yeah. little things where I am trained without even knowing to be paying attention to of like, oh, you're not paying attention. You're not doing this. And I have all this real world experience of, I have a lot of experience working with students, students that, you know, are differently abled, students mm -hmm. that are going through, you know, just all sorts of different diagnoses. I've taught students before in a formal setting that had the only way they were going to remember it is if literally they were rolling on the floor while I was talking, <laughs> then they could focus. But <laughs> if I made <laughs> them sit down, they were not going to remember a thing. Right. So I've have this experience, but I'll get in there and be like, Oh, so-and-so is kind of not into this today. <laughs> and they're just kind of like, making their vote when it's time to make their vote and, you know, not asking questions. But then we get to something, you know, that is affecting the whole school that needs a whole school vote on. Mm. And they're asking really, you know, intelligent questions and really caring about that outcome and how, you know, and maybe they were seven and they are having questions with the 17 year old that are really engaging Mm -hmm. And showing that they are like, no, I get to ask a question. Firstly, right. no one gets <laughs> to tell me I don't get to. That's right. That's and right. secondly, what I have to say is important, but I do want to hear what you're going to say back. I want to actually work together on what is the proper solution for our community. Right. You know, right. 
we can use the word school we can but really what we're we're building a community that's what yeah, yeah. this is and communities have people of different ages and different backgrounds and different interest levels and we have to be able to build something where all of those are respected and can have the dialogue right or else we can't effectively make a community that works for everyone mhm mm mhm mm yeah and it it really i think speaks volumes that you have you know the the 5 6 7 year olds are part of that because mm -hmm. i was just i'm part of the self determination theory community and i'm pretty sure it was the the center for self determination theory uh, kind of does you know social media posts of papers that came out. And one of the papers that came out recently was interesting because they were showing that adolescents who engage imaginatively with socially challenging situations have a much greater development of their sort of prefrontal cortex type of function, executive function type stuff. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're studying mainstream schools. You have to assume that all, all the time. And I think, you know, wow, they're doing this thing where they were able to set up these conditions where some kids get this exposure to dealing with this. But what happens if they're, if they're dealing with it on a daily basis from seven years old or five years old for a decade before they're an adolescent, you know, it's like that, I bet that has a really interesting, you know, consequence if only people would study it. And that's, right. that's the challenge. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and the challenge of, because when people are really only exposed through you know their experience and the and our, and what they see in media of this is what a school is mm -hmm. the idea of anything outside of that is very well that's not you know that's like the the gut reaction is mm -hmm. no that doesn't you can't do that and mm -hmm. it's like no we have we have all these years of like success so right. obviously right. you know yeah not i think it goes back to what you said there's not a linear path if right. if there was a linear path for everyone then we wouldn't have any issues because yeah, we'd right, be able right. to make a linear solution but that's just not that's not even feasible like you would yeah. never you would never say to someone as an individual there is only one line like right and right. not take into account their date like even their day-to-day -day, no one mm -hmm. goes in a line there's ups right. and downs and you know one of the one of the kind of sayings i've lived by in education is the only thing i ever ask for you is the best that you can do today mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you have to be better than yesterday because that's not that's not fair. That's mm -hmm. not reasonable. Mm -hmm. We would never say that to someone in just a general sense. But right, right. for some reason, when people think about schooling, they think, well, there's only this one path and it goes mm -hmm. from K and it ends at 12. Mm -hmm. And you have to do each step of that. And if you're not at this step and when it says you're a five, well, then you're way behind or you're way ahead. And right, right. Well, that that we would never do that to someone's if we weren't thinking in those terms of what right, right. this is what school is. Yeah, and that's one of the things that, that the developmental like when when psychologists started looking at how does development work, one of the first things that that popped into existence was uh, stages, you know, ages and stages kind of thing. And and what we're realizing now is like that's arbitrary doesn't mm -hmm. work that way i mean there is a there is there are sequences because you know like literally you until the nerves in your brain or in your body myelinate there's a speed limit on how those things can work and so yes small children don't function the same as older children or even adults there are physical things and there are some sequential aspects but to say that 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 like normal is is everybody at some level it's like on, and then then saying it about anything other than a single feature of their capabilities it's like you know it, it's it's not realistic it's not the way that the way that stages are popularly conceived is 
uh, just incoherent from an from a biological and 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 behavioral development perspective is people uh, uh, Todd Rose in his book the end of average talks about how you have to think about people as you know if you have a profile like okay here's six features and they're this rare and this there and this you know they're jagged they're not nobody's average so little so the example is great the Air Force was having a problem because planes kept crashing in the late 40s, early 50s, as, as jet aircraft started, started coming in. And and it was not mechanical problems, and it wasn't the pilot error. Even though that was usually what was attributed to, that was not true. And eventually what they, they did was they, they decided, well, the the specs for the aircraft were set in the 20s. Maybe pilots have changed. So they go and remeasure a bunch of people, and they give this data to a guy. And he's like, huh, they have 10 different ways of measuring people to size up a uh, you know the cockpit of an aircraft and he says okay how many people are actually average how many people you know line up right on 10 measures the answer is zero right. nobody is average and even if you go down to just three you still only get like two or three percent of the population and so right. the 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 guy who did this was like oh well nobody's average so if you're designing for the average which literally is what they did they said here's 10 measures take the average design the aircraft for that and it's like that's why you're killing people <laughs> um so so he's saying you know when you have 10 things they're going to be all over the place by definite like like it's it's just that's the way human beings are and and in the education sphere we're talking about more than 10 <laughs> and they're not the physical ones mostly uh you know so they're going to be all over the place so it doesn't make any sense from a developmental perspective, from an education, just a learning perspective. There's, there's just no sense in which you can say something's going to be normal and expect everyone to be at that at some stage. It's just so it's incoherent. Um, yeah. And that's where in designing institutions actually becomes really important. And I think this is the thing that that. The, the surviving free schools from, you know, so Summerhill started, you know, decades, over 100 years ago to all the ones that have started in between is the ones that survived have had an evolutionary pressure to do it right <laughs> or to do something that's that's successful from just a community's perspective. And that's why I think so many hundreds of schools actually failed because they didn't figure it out. But things like Sudbury, Summerhill. Uh, probably the Agile Learning Centers, the, you, you can look at Actons, and th there's all kinds of interesting models. But I think the key is that they found a way for the community to be in conversation with who's actually present now today. Right. And how does and, that work? And it's, and it's, it's so important that it is uh, constantly evolving. If right. you're not constantly evolving, you're going to fail. Like, that's my feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was actually one of my, one of my biggest, you know, when I came into this school environment, I didn't know, I didn't know the, I guess, the, the philosophy or, mm -hmm. you know, however you want to put it. And, and it was really important to me that I was like, okay, are we believing in this as, I guess I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna quote one of my favorite movies. Like, are these beliefs or are these ideas? Because mm. beliefs are tricky. You know, beliefs, mm. people die for beliefs. Right. An idea, you can change an idea. And, and you know, I got, got that answer of, like, it's not, if it's just about being dogma, then you're not actually doing service. If it is about, here's what we believe with an open-mindedness of, but here's how the world is operating now, we must adjust. We must take the temperature of the people that are there. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And, and if, if you're sticking to just that, like here is our, here is the only thing that we will ever allow and this is the rule book and it does not change. Well, that is putting the students in just the same amount of hierarchy and Right. And pressure, it's just in a different way. So it's got to be a conversation and it's got to be a community that is willing to go, okay, this has been what we've been doing and this has worked, but we're seeing, oh, maybe we should take a look at, mm -hmm. should we tweak this, should we move that? It's one of, 
my favorite things that we do with our school meeting is mm. the ability for students to write in changes to the law book. Right. You know, right. and then then that gets discussed, voted on, and if it's approved by a majority of the people that are there voting, then mm -hmm. we change mm -hmm. the law book. And if right. you don't, if you see something that you think is unfair about the law book, put in your motion and let's talk about it and right. we can change it. You know, we're not, we're not writing anything into stone. Right, right. Yeah, and I think that's an important thing that people uh, have a hard time with is, is sort of, well, well, it goes it goes back to, you know, you, you can say with great power comes great responsibility because those all, every kid, every person in that community has mm -hmm. the power to change the rules. Now, not arbitrarily, because they have to, you know, work within the democratic structure. They have to actually get the community to agree to it. Right. But that is a power. That is a power that, that so so I talk about psychological powers in my work and and there are just four. Um, and the first two are uh, is uh, tame the monkey mind and then train the elephant spirit. In the, in meaning that in psychology, we found that they, you basically we have two different kinds of minds. Um, and there's a, there's a metaphor from uh, Jonathan Haidt that um, he talked about, you know, the conscious mind, which is that monkey mind that can be chattery, thinks it's in charge, but it's not. <laughs> because mm -hmm. it rides on the elephant. The elephant is the non-conscious mind, and and if the elephant decides it's going this way, you know, and anybody who's ever tried to change a habit understands exactly what this metaphor is about. Is the elephant's going this way, and the monkey might say, "Oh, we need to go that way," and it's like the elephant's like, "We go this way," <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and that's exactly what continues to happen. Now, the monkey can also be clever, and so can influence the elephant and train the elephant into doing things differently so so those are two powers is is you know chat calming the, the the monkey mind and and training the elephant uh are, are are powers but then the other two powers which are deeply embedded in 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 psychology as and these are not le even less intuitive is the one is change the situation you're in and the fourth is choose a different situation to be in so these are what i call so the situational powers and they actually psychology has shown are far more powerful than anything to do with the monkey and the elephant it is the situational powers are the places where you really make the biggest difference for people. And that's why I focus oftentimes on what are the ways that, that all the, the alternatives that I've been interviewing uh, at, or, you know, like, okay, how do you structure things around decisions and around uh, con resolving conflict? Because those are situational structures that shape the situation. And the important thing is that we've just been talking about is every member of the community, even if they're four or five years old, has the ability to say, I think that's not quite right and let's change it. Now they have to argue coherently and they have to present it to the community and they have to make a case and, and then you know, get a vote on it. So there's, it's not just an arbitrary whim of any random child. It's the that's that's one source for the potential for it like they could come up something it's actually absolutely brilliant and you know yes we'll do that yeah. but it's in check by the community as a whole and so but but that power is there you say oh okay i can change by definition the way that democratic schools more generally and a lot of uh these alternatives work is by definition every member of the community has the power to introduce a change right. and, and, and then it becomes a conversation and, and, and the power to call to account their peers and their fellow community members and say, wait, we agreed to this, not that. And, and as you've described, you know, sort of that, that, but they, even that is not just an arbitrary power. It's something that there's a mechanism for expressing that power. And then there's active conversation about, oh, was this really a broken rule or was this, you know, just somebody being upset with somebody else, you know, and, and, and they get, so they're actively in a conversation about what that means. So it's really yeah. interesting. And, and then also having, having the support structures to make that voice heard. Right. So you might be a five-year-old who wants to change the rule, but doesn't know how to make an argument, doesn't know right. how to write down the thing that you want to change mm -hmm. but then 
having your, you know, for them, it's still like, oh, that's my teacher. But, you know, we don't, we, we're the staff. We're there to go, right. oh, you want to, well, yeah, let me help you write that. Do you want to tell me your ideas? And when we get to that meeting, like, do you want to say it? Mm-hmm. I don't want to talk in front of the whole group. I, I really don't want to do that. Okay. Do you, do you want to tell me what to say for you? Do you want to mm-hmm. dictate, you know, so that it, it also teaches the ability to be inclusive of people that have different strengths and different weaknesses, right. Um, right. which I think is, you know, as, as we were just talking, I was thinking so much about, you know, how much more we, the, the general we, know about neurodiversity than we did, right. you know, 10 years ago, let alone 30 years ago, and, you know, when I was when I was in school, there there wasn't <laughs> like there was right. a couple of things, and it meant you went into a different room and just got left behind. Mm-hmm. Well, the more we learn about, you know, I I did a lot of training in the past couple of years about just how how frequent it is to find that someone who actually has a form of dyslexia or actually has, um, you know. The, the idea that, you know, we think only of autism as a spectrum in general, and you now know, like, well, all of these things are a spectrum. There is no yes or no. There is only what degree of. So the more we learn about that, the more the, the more it just lends itself to, okay, we're learning. There's not this line that we keep coming back to because everyone is is they're, they're on a curved line. Right. <laughs> I mean, so so how do we then open that up to give the same opportunity, the same the same power, the same freedom, whatever word you want to use, how do we make that equitable? Right. And and that's what I really think I really think the more we're learning about the I guess diversity the neurodiversity that we have mm-hmm. as humans, the more it opens us up to making substantial gains in how we educate anyone, right. because we now know that. I mean, I, and that, and and it's both sides of the coin. Like mm-hmm. for me, I grew up as someone who, like, I was reading almost at age three. Now, Mm. I argue that my older sister made me memorize books and then showed me off, but (laughs) (laughs) I was interested in it and I was really far ahead Mm -hmm. in reading. And then I got to kindergarten and first grade and it was like, well, we've got some books for people that are ahead in this that you can go over there and kind of listen to the thing on tape. Mm. That's all you can do. And by third grade, I was just like, all right, well, I guess school is where I just kind of sit and kind of just get through it. And by the time I was in high school, I was like, okay, uh, I've got five classes today. I'll do the homework for the class next in the class before it because I don't have to listen to this because <laughs> I'm not, I guess, not being challenged really Right, is right. the easy way to put it. But, like, it hampers people on that side too. Mm-hmm, exactly, yeah. Because if I had my way, it would have been just, like, being taught I it's okay that I want to do that. And I'm not just getting separated and going like, I don't know, we don't have anything for you to do. So go over there, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had similar, you know, kind of, yeah. They, in third grade, they specifically said, you know, they sent me down to teach the first graders how to read because I was getting into trouble because I was so bored. Um, But they recognize it and, and, you know, they came up with something which was actually turned out really good because I, I think that was the seed of my, my desire to teach uh, and, and so yeah um so one of the things i like to ask is about does your community have sort of special code words or jargon that you think might be really good if it was more broadly used hmm. <laughs> i my brain immediately jumped to something that we just used for for her people in the building mm. of pink we, we say pink panther just mean like hey uh, do this like when your parents say we're going to the the, the restaurant. So be on your like kind of like what outside people should see. Uh, <laughs> uh, <where is> it? <laughs> I think uh, that's a really that's a really good question. 
I'm sure something's going to pop into my brain as soon as so, I so, say So it. actually, let's go. You said, so you said the, the term is Pink Panther? Yeah. So that's just our our school term for, so for our school, we actually are renters. We have mm. the entire bottom floor of a, of a church that is, okay. you know, we have during our school day, well, we actually have three big rooms of that that are our exclusive use. Like mm. we're the only ones with the keys. No one from the church is allowed to go in there. Mm -hmm. But then we have shared spaces, too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so there's like a big industrial kitchen there. And they on Saturdays do they do meals. They have volunteers who do meals for the um, less fortunate in the area, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. people that need a meal. So there's volunteers that will be coming in there prepping. So Pink Panther is our way of like, hey, the volunteers who don't quite understand what our school is about right. <laughs> and might not be OK with y'all just like kind of playing that game that just seems like to them it's they're just running around yelling but for right, us right. It's, <laughs> no you're actively getting that energy out and you're working together to come up with rules and structuring uh -huh. yourself and all those educational benefits that we see mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. someone else doesn't it's like hey pink panther so maybe you know that then everyone in the school goes oh, okay like we're going to take it down a notch uh -huh. Uh -huh. just in terms of like you know it would be the same as you know, when you have someone coming over to visit, you clean the house before they visit right, a little bit right. more than when they don't. And that's Pink Panther is basically that idea. Of Do like, you know the origin of it? Like, what is it? How, how does, how does I Pink think Panther it was relate? just a, I, it was there before I started. And I uh -huh, think it was just uh -huh. a cool way for them to be able to, like, to say something. I, I've uh -huh, had jobs yeah. in the past where there were just, like, kind of code words of, like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and it was more for just, like, hey, are you okay? But you don't want mm -hmm. that person to know that they might be like, you don't want to go like, Hey, is that person bo bothering you yeah, right yeah, in front yeah. of them? So you say yeah. like this little, little saying in front of a question that tells them, this is your opportunity to tell me like, Hey, let's go have a conversation over there. You know? Right. 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 No, yeah. that's a perfect example though, is, is having that code word, you know, it, it, it's something that, that, that you have to be context sensitive. Um, mm -hmm. And and that's one of the things the kids are learning is like okay there's there's a context I need to attend to what's outside of you know a, a bordering on my world um, because we're, what you're doing is is recognizing that there is a larger community that can have an impact if they see things they don't understand and right. and can't deal with productively because they don't have you know they're not part of the justice system or the uh, uh, restoration committee or you know like yeah like that's not an opportunity we have with them so we need to operate in a different way that's a perfect right. example and that, i i think that's yeah that that's probably the the term that because it comes up a lot just for it, it comes up for understanding that we have our rules but also we are in a building that we don't control all of the rules right so right. here is our way of going oh now we're on like, you know, this has nothing to do with the person sitting next to me in school or the right. staff member or whatever. <clears throat> like the landlord says, don't do this. So mm -hmm. we don't do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So let's see. Yeah, we're I'm going to start wrapping up. But I like to end where we began with some storytelling. OK, so tell me a story about a challenge that either an individual or the school faced. and after in in the aftermath they were the maybe the school was better or that person was better for having met that challenge oh we had a we had a we had an extremely serious challenge this year just had an a really unfortunate fortunate incident where um where decisions were made that were just not not acceptable for the school and had to had to go through a really difficult process of you know whether or not the school member could stay with us mm, or yeah, if they yeah. were the right person to be there mm -hmm. and had to had to watch and this is this is kind of goes right back into that storytelling of watching people that you might not think are connected get really connected Mm. where and it, and it it was shocking how a really you know just 
it was it was just not fun like mm. it was decisions that you could empathize with that also mm. were not acceptable mm. uh, it is you know i can't go into too much more detail than that mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. the whole school had to then deal with mm-hmm. and yeah. and it was sad and it was like trying to figure out exactly what happened mm. and to watch once again that just community of everyone all of a sudden the people that you didn't think cared mm. uh, you know and you know that everyone does at a certain level but some people's idea of what they want to do to learn is i want to just do my thing and right. i want to do my thing and not engage with all the other stuff Mm-hmm. And that's fine because eventually they find the moment where they do, or they find what they want, which is more important than if they engage with everyone else. Did they mm-hmm. find what they needed? But then we have this this m- week of, you know, usually it's only one time a week that every member of the school has to be in a meeting, mm-hmm. and that's mostly for just general announcements. And then if there is motions that we need to vote on you get the choice of whether or not you even want to stay for that Mm -hmm. but this was a week of everyone has to be here every day this week while we talk about this and decide you know what is our path forward you know Mm. is it you know do we let people go do we believe in you know do, do we we obviously believe in the idea of okay we learn and we grow Mm -hmm. but then is this something that we can continue, Mm. you know, and just watching not only everyone engage in that and come to what they thought the decision was, Mm -hmm. but watching the, watching the respect of Mm. the people who are week in and week out every time they are the people that actually stay and vote and talk about everything watching them listen to every word that the people who never do that are saying Mm. respect it talk through it together come Mm. to a i believe you know almost i believe it was almost a um 100 vote on our decision like Mm -hmm. because enough conversation happened that it wasn't and it was definitely not 100 when we all started talking Mm, you know And, and and then coming out of that it's like okay like how how much of this is going to just be on shoulders and like mm. what is going to be the i guess psychological feeling of the the room and of the school and because everyone really took the time to engage and care about what is the choice we're going to make we walked in within 2 days there was a complete different air of light in the room. Mm. Like there was a different energy to our school Mm -hmm. because everyone had, had worked together and had built, uh, had really made a tough situation into, okay, we, we as a community have, have come together and Mm. all of a sudden you didn't even realize that there were some, you know, you didn't, it, it's one of those things where sometimes you don't even realize there's any sort of friction in the air. Mm. And then when you come together and you kind of finally talk about it, you're like, oh my God, everything feels so much better now because mm. we just went through this. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that just really, it cemented into me what the idea of having a truly, you know, Uh, I guess, democratic process Mm -hmm. was of, of, of just watching people listen to each other. And then the thing for me as, as a staff member who was very invested in that conversation too, but then also getting to, you know, you get to watch a little bit with the perspective of watching people grow Mm -hmm. and living through it Mm -hmm. was just watching the, just that that it wasn't a weight on the shoulder it was actually like 
oh, and now mm. we've been lifted up into mm. a completely different area of of just positivity because mm. everyone came together for it. Mm -hmm. I know there were not a lot of specifics there, but it's just the yeah. overwhelming <laughs> thing that is jumping out to me. So, so to if I can probe a little bit to understand it, so is it something that arose within sort of restoration committee and then moved to an all school meeting, or was it something that kind of? Um, uh, it was. It was something that. It was something that was, that was unforeseen and just actions that happened out like not even during school hours, but in oh, wow. okay. school. Okay. Um, okay. And and it and it you know, at the at the end of the day, I can say it came to our school had had built a space that was safe enough that people thought this is where I can go when it wasn't the time to be, mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of, oh, this is where I'm safe. So they'll fix everything. And, mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't, you mm -hmm. know, it wasn't the mm -hmm. right choice. Right. Right. So, but yeah, it was, it was something that just came out of the blue and was mm. something that was like, okay, this is, this is bigger than a restoration committee. This is a full uh, school yeah. involvement. Yeah. 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 And that, that's, I think what I was wanting to make sure I was clear on is that, is that there are times when you have to kind of put everything else on hold and deal with something that has come up in, in the world. Um, right. And it can look many different ways. It might just be your community dealing with its own, effectively internal even if it didn't happen at the school you have to deal with it as a school right. or it could be world events you know that that happens too um, yeah yeah but it's really important to note that your community is operating in a way that that demonstrates that there there's nothing sacred about whatever is on the schedule for today in a sense mm -hmm. you know it's like like there are things that you just have to like Put everything on hold and deal with, and and I and I think that's that's something that some schools need to some more mainstream schools should consider the possibility that there are things that should stop the entire school community and and deal with, and that there should be you know th that's okay <laughs> that is right. in itself a valuable thing even when you get it wrong. So I, I think of an example of. I, I volunteered at the village free school for, for um, well, for many years, but but in one year in particular, I was there on a daily basis. Uh, I was covering someone's maternity leave for a semester, and then and then ended up teaching a psychology class for the whole year. But um, but I remember this one nine or ten year old boy who just couldn't find something, and so st you know called an all school meeting, you know, stop everything uh, to say his thing was stolen. And literally, he's yeah, as he's making his case, someone goes, "Oh, you mean this?" <laughs> you know, and picks it up <laughs> off the ground or something. You know, and and of course, he was you know just phenomenally embarrassed, and and you know, it was it was like you know wasting everybody's time. But that in itself, even doing it wrong, one there was a lot of people who were there to like, oh yeah, sorry, you know, it, it, there was sympathy for his having taken. There, there were people who were annoyed, but <laughs> but yeah. but it's like you know. He's young. He's you know it's it's okay to make that mistake, um, right. and it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't you know terribly impactful. It's just like everyone was interrupted for the day, and then they went back to their thing. But that's exactly the kind of thing that that a, a, a properly supportive community can flow with, even somebody making a mistake that feels big in that moment. Yeah, and and that. And then, the, oh, I'm sorry. And then and then come out on the other side and be, oh, okay. You know, uh, to a little bit less of a like, wow, this huge thing. Like, we've had, we've had a, in the past, we've had a really hard time with kind of, we, we offer sometimes if it seems like it's more interpersonal than it is yeah. actual rule breaking and right. it's people just not getting along, you know, we, we do have a system for mediation and mm, nice. we got into some, uh, there were some interpersonal things this year that came up that that we're like, well, I think this really is a situation where mediation is in is the proper choice, and mm -hmm. we had some pushback from from not necessarily the students that were in it, but the the mm. 
the clerks that were like, I don't know if we should make that decision because in the past that has always just felt like a lecture and mm. no one wants to be there and and it just ends up being this thing. It's like and 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 what I had to do as someone who was newer to being a staff member on mediation would be well i uh, let's see if they would be even willing to come in the room if they mm -hmm. are let's give this a try and just mm -hmm. you know we can have actually a because usually mediation is more of a like let's get peers out of the equation and just mm -hmm. talk with that one individual and right. a staff mediator mm -hmm. in this case it was like we can ask them if a if a RC clerk, restoration committee clerk, can be there as well, mm. so that we're all working together, so it doesn't feel like, oh, the adult is lecturing. Because that's <laughs> yeah. not. You're right. That will never be effective. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we we did that and had this had this really positive experience of talk. Just talk to me. Like I'm not going to tell you what to do. Just talk to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And and let's really just establish rules in this room about you're like you don't have to agree in fact mm. you don't i we know that you already don't so <laughs> don't but you have to the only thing we ask is that you listen mm -hmm. and and we're not going to tell you how to feel about that mm -hmm. just listen mm -hmm. and giving that power not only did we come to something that was like oh okay i think we can see eye to eye but then Two weeks later, those two people are literally hanging out and you and you're talking about how they were texting the night before and like mm -hmm. you know just mm -hmm. it's like okay you you've gone through like it was they were not being kind to each other <laughs> like it was mm -hmm. real mm -hmm. like yeah. there was a reason for mediation and and then oh look at that you took some time to figure out how to talk to each other mm -hmm. respect each other and found out that you weren't that far off from what you each wanted. And now you're not only getting along, but being friendly outside of school. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that that might <laughs> give me a second. That might even be a better answer <laughs> right. to the original question. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it, 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 it's always interesting because there's, there's different levels of the reason I asked the question the way I do is because it evokes different levels of, of, of what people bring to forward so you brought two very different levels of story and i think that's great that's actually a really important thing to understand is that there are different levels at which these things operate in which humans operate and and collectively we need to understand there is a sort of collective mind about these there's a reason we call it community and you know it mm -hmm. it, it it does operate at those multiple levels and and it is valuable to understand those stories and say oh okay you know one conflict can be so intense and it can be intense in ways that you know, like you say, mediation is a different beast than than you know justice committee or restoration or whatever. Yeah. You know, there, there's there's different processes. I, I ran that also at the village free school. Is that I, I asked them, I interviewed them at the end of this last season uh, mm -hmm. for this show, and 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 they were talking about how you know when I when I did I did some research at their school about 12 years ago, but at that time it was all very formal. You know, right up. It wasn't every day, but it was several times a week. And 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 then they had kind of financial crisis and moved to into a basement of a church like you did, and then they've moved again since, and or actually twice since, and so the formality drifted away. Like that was just uh, the formality wasn't working, and they had a very small basement. Uh, sounds like you have a big basement, yeah, uh, but nice. they had a small basement <laughs> in the church, uh, and so they found that nothing could wait. Like you had to deal with it right now, or or it was just ruining everybody's day. So so they. A consequence of that is that they, they, as a community, develop skills. They develop skills to handle conflict in different ways. And uh, the thing that was, I found curious was uh, because I was, you know, hadn't, hadn't talked with them in a while, I found out that, that the formality piece came back uh, after a while, uh, hung around for about a year, and then went away again. <laughs> so so right. once again, it's, it's really emphasizing that fluidity, that who's here, what's working, what isn't. And, and I think that's a, that's a really, you know, that's something that that I don't know that that is there. There's not a common understanding I I haven't seen about about how what it means to have be that fluid as an organization. 
is that there's there's this very interesting tension between what's stable and what changes because human beings need both, <laughs> yeah. uh, especially when it's a changing community uh, that, that people come and go every year. And so then you, you know, then there's things that are stable and, and it's a really, it, it, you mentioned it before, sort of ideologically or dogmatically saying this is, who, you know, this and not this. And it's like, well, okay. I'm, but I think a lot of community, communities are realizing that the, the dogma doesn't serve them very well, particularly right. around, you know, any particular tool that they might be using to their community. Like at Village Free School, there's three rules that they never change. Take care of yourself and others. Take care of the stuff that, that everybody owns. And then remember that your freedom ends where somebody else's begins. So it's pretty <laughs> pretty basic stuff. So so yeah, I think it, it's really interesting to to get a, you know, take a broader perspective and, and understand different levels at which it's it's working. Yeah. And that, that's very consistent with our we have a preamble rule which is mm -hmm. very much around that that idea of like our number one it's it's before the rules even start. Preamble is you treat others with respect. Basically that idea of treat others with respect, you respect you treated with and also that includes treating your community both school and things where your action represents the school. So yeah. if you have a big campus and you're going to the pro -yo, and then you, you, you're you taking the sample that is the size of the huge thing, so that is my sample, that affects us all. No, I'm not going to get to go. Right. I, don't, I don't know why I throw you in my head today. Maybe it's because it's the first night nice day in Chicago. <laughs> um, you know, um, but yeah, it's very similar. Right on. There's right the on. preamble, and then we have the 35 page log after the preamble. Nice, nice. So, so let's let's wrap up here. Before we go, tell people how they can find out more, get in contact with with you and or Tall Grass more generally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Tall Grass Sudbury School, Range, Illinois. It is tallgrasssudbury.org. So. Look that up. It is with the three S's. Every time people spell it, they get to tall grass and just think that S is part of Sudbury because the three <laughs> S's look weird. And, you know, there's also, you know, everything is on is on the site. There's videos on, like, what a typical day looks like, which is really hard because there is no typical day right. because everyone does something different. There is, you know, there is all the information on our enrollment process for the next school year, what we're doing, our calendar, all of the contact information. You can also find us at info at tallgrasssudbury.org. And our staff is really good at, at Monday through Friday, getting back to emails really quickly. Those are the, those are the best places. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, for more for more detailed information about you know setting up setting up tours setting up mm. you know the ability to come to the school you know all the information for how to reach us is, is on the website i don't usually just give out the phone number because it's all connected yep, to google fine. voice and don't want it to go to another staff member's phone and be like yeah, wait yeah, what yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's there and then yeah i think those are the best places and cool you know, always always willing to talk about you know that's one of the things we do a lot of is just people that are interested in learning more about it but maybe don't mm -hmm. have a student yeah. we're interested in talking to you and you know showing you this is what we do and how we do it mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. if that's something you can use in your life or you know we were interested in growing Growing the idea of democratic school, a Sudbury school, like those philosophies, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. far more than just a like. And now we must enroll you to us. <laughs> yeah. we, want, we want the the idea out there. Nice, nice. All right, thank you very much, Rick. I really yeah. appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. All right. <laughs> This has been the Agentic Schools Vodcast. I would love to hear from you. Please share what resonates with you from this episode. What do you think 
about schools that support children to exercise their agency on a daily basis. Agentic schools operate from within a new education paradigm. I wrote the Agentic Schools Manifesto to help you make sense of that new paradigm. The manifesto is available as a membership benefit when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more. This vodcast is a co-production of Attituder Media and Deeper Learning Advocates. At Deeper Learning Advocates, we seek to embed the psychology of learning in policy so that policy stops undermining learning. The financial support of our audience is crucial to accomplishing that mission. You can find out more about the manifesto and join the cause at dladvocates.org. One final thing, I also offer a free course called Motivation Myth Busting for School Teachers. To sign up, visit holisticequity.org. Go to the Tools tab and click on Free Motivation Course. Thank you for your kind attention.